sometimes it's useful to become acquainted with the precise meaning of these words and to see what they mean in their original context. It's useful to know what the, what the Pali word is. Okay, so the word dasana here, which is what we translate as seeing, has the meaning, special meaning of the first seeing through, well, seeing always implies to direct cognition, through direct experience of the Four Noble Truths in their entirety. And this is a technical term for the initial breakthrough to the Dhamma, what's called the gaining of the Eye of the Dhamma. And this refers to attaining the stage of Sotapatti, the stage of stream entry, whereby the truth of the Dhamma opens up to one's inner vision and one sees directly the Four Noble Truths. Then once one acquires that vision of the truths, one has to develop that vision through continued practice. The attainment of this vision of the truths, the seeing of the truths, is not liberation yet, but it is the opening up of the path to liberation, so that one steps onto the path and is assured of ultimate realization, ultimate liberation. One can never revert back from the path, but one has to continue to develop the vision to develop the qualities of the Noble Eightfold Path until they ripen in full enlightenment, full realization. And so technically, we say that the attainment of seeing means reaching the first stage of enlightenment and then the practice of development means that one develops this vision through the second, third stages onto the path to the fourth stage, the stage of arhatship. Though in order to arrive at that experience of seeing, one has to develop the path in the preliminary stage as well. Okay, so now the Buddha speaks about taints to be abandoned by seeing. And so he raises the question, what taints should be abandoned by seeing? Then he's going to illustrate this by taking the specific case of what is called the untaught, ordinary person, sometimes translated the uninstructed worldly. Okay, so this is an ordinary person, a person without any degree of realization, direct understanding of truth, who has no regard for the noble ones. He doesn't have any special respect or reverence for the noble persons. He is unskilled in their teaching, in their dhamma. He doesn't have knowledge of their teaching and he's undisciplined in their dharma. That is, he is not trained in the practice that pertains to their teaching. Okay, then he has no regard for the true men. The true men is the same as the noble ones. And unskilled, he's unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma. This person does not understand what things are fit for attention and what things are unfit for attention. Since that is so, he attends to those things unfit for attention and he does not attend to those things that are fit for attention. 
Now the commentary to the sutta makes a very interesting and important point in this connection. It ex explains that actually there are no things that are exclusively fit for attention and no things that are exclusively unfit for attention. The difference doesn't consist in the things themselves, but in the way one attends to them. So we could take the same things that are ordinarily considered unfit for attention, and if we apply to them skillful attention, then they can become, or wise attention, then they can become a basis for the positive development of the mind. For example, within the context of the monk's life, <laughs> excuse me, but it's usually considered the form of the beautiful woman is something unfit for attention, in the sense that if one attends unwisely to the form of the woman, then sensual craving is going to arise. And then that will bring trouble to the mind. And in the case of many, or you know, some monks, they might want to leave the monastic life and return to the household life. Okay, but if one knows the proper way of attention, then one could take even the form of the most <laughs> beautiful bathing beauties, Miss Universe, Miss America, whatever, and one applies what's called the <laughs> a super, <laughs> a super sanya, the perception of the unattractive nature of the body, <laughs> and one starts penetrating, or first one can even examine the parts of the body close up, hair of the head, you just cut off some of that beautiful hair, spread it out on the table, <laughs> look at it, <laughs> will you fall in love with that beautiful hair? <laughs> or oh, one maybe shaves off some of the hair under the arms, <laughs> puts it on the table. Is it really lovely and beautiful? <laughs> um, cuts, she cuts her fingernails, takes the fingernails, puts them on the table. <laughs> maybe the dentist pulls out a tooth, you go to the dentist and say, can I have that tooth? <laughs> or some of her flakes of the, of the skin, peel off, if you get sunburn, the skin peels off, put it down. So we have some head hairs, body hairs, fingernails, a tooth, and peelings of the skin. <laughs> Beautiful or not? <laughs> and then one starts, if one is a surgeon, one tucks into the body, performs the operation, there's beneath that beautiful skin, there is just muscle, nerves, bones, kidneys, heart, the liver, lungs, and so on. So putting this all together, there's nothing there that's very beautiful. Okay, so if we attend to these things that are normally considered unfit for attention, then they can become a means for reducing the asadas, reducing these Okay, so now the Buddha raises the question, what are the things unfit for attention that he attends to? Okay, they are things such that when he attends to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire arises in him, and the arisen taint of sensual desire increases, the arisen taint of being, this is craving for continued existence, continued individuality arises in him, and the arisen taint of being increases, the unarisen taint of ignorance arises, and the arisen taint of ignorance increases. Those are the things unfit for attention that he attends to. Okay, then what are the things fit for attention that he does not attend to? They are things such that when he attends to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire does not arise, and the arisen taint of sensual desire is abandoned. The arisen taint of craving for existence does not arise, 
and the arisen taint of craving for existence is abandoned. The unarisen taint of ignorance does not arise and the arisen taint of ignorance is abandoned. These are the things fit for attention that he does not attend to. By attending to things unfit for attention, by not attending to things fit for attention, unarisen taints arise and arisen taints increase. Okay, so if we take the commentarial explanation, what is meant by the attending to things that one should not attend to means that one attends to things, anything, in terms of what are called the distorted modes of attention. And these, according to the Buddha's teaching, are four types. They're attending to what is unattractive, not beautiful, attending to it as beautiful. I gave the example of attending to the body, the physical body, which if one looks at it analytically, it's not beautiful, not attractive, but if one grasps the impression of the whole, it appears beautiful, and then one becomes attached to it, and this can cause the craving for sensual enjoyment to arise. Then becoming attached or attending to what is impermanent as permanent. And so this will apply, it can apply to anything, but it can apply specifically to certain deep states of tranquility meditation, where one experience, in which one experiences a state of either radiant bliss, deep peacefulness, and one could then take this to be a disclosure, a contact with some kind of permanent, everlasting state of existence. But if one contemplates this peaceful or blissful state methodically with wise attention, one will see that this state is impermanent. It arises when one makes the appropriate effort, when one sustains one's attention on it, when one turns the attention away, when one relaxes that effort, that state subsides and ends. And so one sees the impermanent as being, in that case, as being impermanent. The th third distorted way of understanding is, or distorted way of attention, is attending to what is really dukkha, unsatisfactory, unsatisfying, as being blissful or a source of happiness. Again, this could apply to either sensual pleasures, one takes the sensual pleasures to be really a source of bliss and su sustainable happiness. But if one attends wisely to the sensual pleasures, one sees that these sensual pleasures are impermanent because they're impermanent, they're not really satisfactory, one sees how to attain the sensual pleasures, one has to go through a lot of trouble and turmoil. While one is enjoying them, enjoying them, the mind is accompanied by some degree of anxiety and clinging. And if one loses them, then one falls into misery, dejection, even despair. And this wrong attention can apply as well to these blissful meditative states. Again, if one takes them to be permanent, one also takes them to be blissful, truly stable and secure. But if one attends to them as being through their impermanence, then one sees that they're ultimately dukkha, unsatisfactory, inadequate, or flawed. And then the fourth unwise mode of attention 
is attending to what is really not self, not the true I, as being my real self, my true I. So this is basically, it's the view of Sakaya Ditti, the view of a substantial self existing in any way in regard to the five aggregates. And so when one identifies, whether it be the body, feelings, perceptions, volitional activities, or consciousness as being myself, the property of myself, that way of attention arises from ignorance and it contributes to the sustaining of all of these taints. It sort of feeds back into the underlying ignorance, reinforces that ignorance, reinforces the craving for continued existence, even in somewhat, to some extent it can reinforce the craving for sensual pleasures. Okay, so those are the things Let's say these are the unwise modes of attention which he applies to when he attends to anything. And attending in this way will cause unarisen taints to arise and arisen taints to increase and become stronger. Okay, maybe I'll pause at this point and then ask whether there are any questions. Okay, please, what is your name? Martha. Martha? Martha Lucia. M-A-G-E-A, Martha. M-A-G-E-A. Martha, Martha. M-A-G-E-A. D-A. Martha. 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 Magda. Magda. Like the G. Like Magdalena. Magdalena, okay. Okay. <laughs> the, the last four that you mentioned, yeah. it seems like it's all just one, which is um, the attachment of the impermanence as person. Like all four of them fall under that category. Let us say that the first one is somewhat distinct. This is the way of attending to the unattractive as if it were attractive. Now, the mode of attending to the impermanent, as if it were permanent, this becomes, let us say, the impermanence, the mark of impermanence, is actually the foundation for the other two characteristics. Of course, there are some things which are actually clearly and definitely painful and the source of misery. So that doesn't depend upon impermanence. But things that are pleasurable and enjoyable, we normally regard as being pleasant and enjoyable. But if we look at these things from the standpoint of being, of their impermanence, then we can see that they're unsatisfactory. And so this is another implication of the Pali word dukkha. Dukkha means literally pain or suffering. But it has this broader meaning of what is unsatisfactory, what is inadequate, what has Deep, what is defective, and everything becomes defective, everything can, impermanent is defective because of its impermanence. And so impermanence will lead into the mark of unsatisfactoriness, and then also impermanence leads into the mark of selflessness. Because these five aggregates, which will come, we'll explain them in greater length later, but the body, feelings, perceptions, volitions, consciousness, they're all impermanent. Because they're impermanent, they can't be taken as a substantial self. And so the mark of non-self follows from the mark of impermanence. But there's still somewhat different ways of viewing things. Did somebody else have a question? Yes. Bhante, I, don't, I don't know if uh, I heard you right, but the difference between the asanas and the unwholesome rooms, did you say something about karma with one dealt with karma and one didn't? 
Yeah, what I said is that the unwholesome roots, greed, hatred, and delusion, are mentioned specifically as the roots of unwholesome actions. So they're what, those are the factors that create unwholesome karma. The asanas are not so specifically, to my recollection, not so specifically connected with karma. Of course, naturally, they will create actions born from these asanas will create karma, but the way they function in the teaching, they're not so explicitly connected with, with karma, to my recollection. Your name again? Katie. Katie, right. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I don't normally use the word influx, in, in, <laughs> yeah. so, and I don't have a dictionary with me, but I'm wondering if influence uh, would be, that, that's something that just resonates a little more. And, and, and then the related question is, when you said the primordial source of yeah. Yeah. Um, the taints that resonate a little bit in the concept of sin, and I'm wondering if there's a sense of, there's a clear distinction that this isn't something that resides, for lack of a better term, within the person. It's, it's influences that are, are outside that, that okay. could okay. defile someone. This is something we go through every Saturday. <laughs> it seems during the week that they just hit the bell a few times and finish. But on Saturday when we're having the class, it seems interminable, the <laughs> ringing of the bell. Is it just my impression or do you, my personal impression, or is, do you sense that too? Some translators have actually used the word influence as a rendering for asava. And so it's a possibility. <coughs> the only risk, and it agrees with the literal meaning of the word. Though in English, the word influence has lost its connection to its etym etymological origins. But influence comes from fluid, fluence is flowing. And in means, of course, in. So it's flowing in. What flows in is an influence. But I don't like to use influence because asanas are considered things which are always unwholesome, whereas influences can be good and bad. Okay, then your second question, whether asava corresponds, first, whether it corresponds to the idea of sin. First, in Buddhism, we don't have a term that, to my mind, brings along the specific connotations of the idea of sin in Christianity, of some kind of original corruption, <coughs> moral corruption. The asavas, as well as the other qualities, like the unwholesome roots, are usually viewed purely as psychological of factors, mental factors. They're mental factors responsible for bondage and suffering, but they don't have that weight, of, that sense of being evil, much less do they suggest something like the idea of sin, I think the original meaning is separation, but the idea that it is what is, brings about a separation from God. So the asavas don't have that sense. But I do, in my understanding, the asavas should be understood as things that, I take it to mean things that flow into active consciousness from the deep recesses of the mind. So this is my own understanding, that the word is not actually analyzed or explained in that way in, in the Buddhist texts themselves. In fact, no explanation of the word is given, no derivation of the word is given within the sutta texts. I have a, 
a simple question um, etymological. What does sabasava mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sabasava. It's just sabha is all. So it's all plus asava. That's why it's called sub sabasava sutta. This course on all the things. Okay, I should have explained that. <laughs> Any further questions? Okay, so we'll, we'll end now. And then we have, after lunch, we have at 12 o'clock, we have the little discussion period. So if anybody likes to come back for further discussion, then we'll meet back here at 12 o'clock. Okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. And so we want to share these merits with other beings when we speak on Dhamma, listen to Dhamma, discuss Dhamma, we get what is called some kind of wholesome Dhamma, we call this merit. And in Buddhism we don't keep this merit to ourselves, like accumulation of a bank account, but we use it to share with other beings. And so we think of, first, of what are called the Dhamma-protecting deities, and we share the merit with them, you could think of any departed relatives and friends, relatives or friends, as well as all beings in general. And so we send out these merits with the hope, especially that the Dhamma protecting deities will protect the Buddha's teachings, protect the world, protect ourselves and others. Okay, so I'll recite using verses in Pali. And okay, next time you... I'll recite now, but next time you can distribute the sheets with the verses. So just think with loving kindness of the Dhamma protecting deities, any departed beings, friends or relatives, and all beings in general. Tu kāpa mūchāntu, pūsāntu nī 